Have you ever started a journey and looked behind you and asked, where did I come from? Who's my parents? Mm -hmm. And why do I love the things I love or dislike the things I dislike? Hi, my name is Samuel F. Robinson. I'm, a, I'm here right now with Reverend Dr. Manuel A. Howard. And he's going to share a story that's going to help shed a light. In fact, mm -hmm. some of you you may actually experience a transformation right here that's going to set your life on a different path than what you thought it was going to go into. Introducing. Tell me about yourself. Hey, hey I'm excited <laughs> to be here. I'm telling you, um, this is my brother from another mother, Samuel Robinson. And for all y'all out there who may or may not know me, this is your boy, Dr. Howard. And I wanted to share a little bit about my story. Um, it's a crazy story, not really, but uh, it's a transformational story. And I was born to a 15 year old mother. Yep, 15 years old and she had little old me. And my father was 16 at the time, never got together, never got married, none of that. They were just kids having fun, doing whatever they wanted to do. And as a result of that, I was placed into foster care at the age of two, the tender age of two. And the reality is my foster mother and father, they had the greatest hearts that one could ever have because they nicknamed me Bumper, like the car, Bumper, um, because I was a Tasmanian devil and linebacker at the age of two. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So it's been quite a transformational journey, my brother. And for all of you out there, I know a little bit about transformation. Um, actually, the Lord took me on windy roads to get me to a place where uh, my doctoral work uh, is as a scholar in transformational leadership and transformative learning. So if you want to know about transformation, we need to talk. Oh, wow. Now, understanding that at two years old, what do you remember at two years old? One of the biggest things that I remember at two years old was that my five foster brothers and sisters, well, six, uh, I was number seven to join the crew. None of them looked like me. Wow. And that's one thing I'll never forget. Looking around, none of them looked like me. None of them acted like me because I was shot out of a cannon. Mm. Now, when you say they don't look like you, take us back to the city and state. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, was born in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, Bryn Mawr Hospital. Uh, us folks from Bryn Mawr, we're really from Garrett Hill. We call our little area Garrett Hill. So anybody will know in Pennsylvania. So you know Bryn Mawr, um, but you, those who are local really know Garrett Hill and really beyond because Garrett Hill has been placed on the map. Um, we got a few famous names out of there. One that you will definitely know is the late, great Emlyn Tennell. Well, we're going to dive into that one a little bit later. One of my mentors in, as for all of us in the community and many of you throughout the world. Nice. So Philly, where I also grew up, you're there at two years old. Let's fast forward to when you started asking questions. Why do I look different? Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting because you think that you're, you know, as a young kid, a young child, your brothers and sisters, you think I should look like I should look like somebody, you know. So early on, I was quite confused. Um, I was angry. Um, I didn't know what to do or how to do. Um, but I just... It's crazy because I was always full of energy, full of life. And, you know, I had to get the switch often because I just was running. I was fighting. I, I was doing everything because I didn't know where I was and what I was really supposed to do and who these people fully were. I knew that they were my new parents. I would be living with them the majority of the time. I, my birth mother and father would come visit from time to time. But oftentimes those times got longer and longer before we would see one another. Mm. And I'll never forget this one time when they told me they were going to come pick me up. And it was a Christmas morning and they never came. And I'll tell you what, that was one of the most difficult and challenging experiences and transformational experiences that I had ever experienced as a child that I've taken with me even now as an adult. And when, you know, I don't miss a Christmas for my children, you know, I'm always there, always available. And to be honest, my, my mother, my birth mother has never missed a Christmas or a birthday for my children. Mm. So that event that occurred created a void that now in your later years, your current years, you made a decision not to allow that to happen. So you make a, an intentional decision 
to avoid that from happening. And for you who are parents, you a lot of times you don't understand how your words or your lack of keeping your word affects a child. At that young age, it shaped your destiny. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, it turns out to be good. In some other cases, it's not so good. Either way, it leaves a scar. In today's age, a lot of parents raise their kids and they're so protective, it's as if they're raising sheep. When the kid goes out into the world, they don't have the character to survive. And this creates a challenge for them. They get eaten up by the world and the world tears them apart. Yeah. Instead of them being a lion or a lioness. And mom and dad raised them in an environment that exposed them to get shaped. Mm. but still protected enough so that they're not damaged. Yes. And now when they go out into the world, they go out with a healthy sense of self-identity. Mm, that's good. Understand that for you. How did your experience as a child push you towards a doctorate and a reverend? Well... Let me tell you, I was blessed that I happened to land with the foster family that I did. Um, you know, growing up in, in Radnor, Pennsylvania, uh, I say Bryn Mawr, there's a couple of Rosemont, there's a couple of names, but the, the township was Radnor Township. And I was blessed to live with, uh, they're no longer here now. Um, my foster father, uh, George F. Sidnor, he was the first African-American police officer and detective in an all-white community and a Hall of Fame uh, track star, world record, Villanova University track with Jumbo Elliott. Uh, my mother, my foster mother raised the whole community. She had five of her own, uh, my adopted sister who was two years younger than me, and she raised the rest of the community as well. So she had a love and a heart for people. Um, so I developed, um, even though I was a little wild and crazy, uh, they brought me back in focus with direction and discipline and tough love and all of that, where I learned to always be preparing. I learned to never be late. Um, and if you're on time, you're late. I learned to love and respect people. I, I learned to honor um, the elders and those who've come before you and standing upon their shoulders. So when you talk about how did I get to there and there, but I mean, there's a whole lot to this. I mean, we'd have to sit down for a long time. You can read one of my books, um, but the reality is it was a transformational journey. And, you know, to go from foster kid who should have never made it out of high school and graduated, but graduated from one of the top high schools in the country, Radnor High School, was an athlete. Um, I wasn't truly a scholar then, I have to be honest, I have to confess, I did enough to get by. Um, was homecoming king, loved people, um, always connected with people, and then moved on and got some degrees and all that good stuff. But it was a journey. I had some mental health challenges, mental wellness, dealt with anxiety, dealt with PTSD, dealt with all those things that a little old foster kid deals with. And then they said, well, how did you overcome this stuff? It was the foundation. It was the foundational disciplines. It was the love. I said, I like to say they loved the hell out of me because I was hell on wheels. I told you the Tasmanian devil and linebacker at two years old. So that transition took time. It took patience. It took setbacks. It took fall downs. It took getting back up time and time again. And I still got a long way to go, y'all. Let me just tell you, titles are great. And getting there is even more great, the, the, the journey, you know. But when you get there, you also realize how much you don't know. Um, so when I completed my doctorate, I said, man, I really don't. I know a lot about this subject. I'm a scholar in transformational leadership and transformative learning. I said, but there's a lot that I don't know. You hear what I'm saying, Samuel? I mean, a lot. And I believe the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. But the journey to Reverend, um, man, I'll tell you, and I, I got to tell you this, and it's going to be brief, but in 2005, um, for the first time in my life, I heard the audible voice of God. I was engaged at the time. I lost my job. I lost my fiance. And I really lost my mind. It was about 24 hours in, I went back home to my foster parents who received me and loved me just like they did when I was two years old. 
and I was laying in the room and nobody was home. I was disgusted, broke, busted, out of my mind. And the thought of suicide came to mind. What would, what would it all be? It would all be over if I just drove my car into the R5 train station in Garrett Hill. Wow. And man, I tell you, I laid there. I didn't talk to any, my phone was blowing up. I didn't know, I, nobody could get a hold of me. I was just in a state of depression, oppression, and I thought I was out for the count. But then the Lord spoke to me for the first time, the audible voice of God said, what about the children? And man, I, I th I'm getting chills all over my body right now because every time I think about that moment, he says, what about the children? I said, well, I was working with foster kids at a residential. I spoke to some kids at some agencies and said, he said, what about the children? And then fast forward, uh, the Lord opened the door for me to go to seminary and get my doctorate. And then I began to read the scriptures and be steeped in the scriptures for three years and wow. found that over 400 times in the Bible, it said children of God. Cool. And then when the Lord made that comparison, my life changed. It was never the same. It was a process. It was a, process. It was a transformative process. It was a transformational process to go from suicide possibilities and ideation to doctoral and pastoral ministry. So I, I can't tell you, I can't tell it all right now. Get the book. Yeah, go get the book. And our latest book now, Rise Above. You see. My God, my God, Rise Above. This is it, y'all. And you see who's on there. My mentor, my friend, and I like to say I'm one of his protégés. And there was 14 others right here. We're on the back. Our, you know, individual copies are coming soon. But rise above, rise above. And I'll tell you, everything in my life from the time I was two and even before that I had to rise above. And if you want to learn and hear some inspirational stories about rising above, these are the folks here that share that story and that testament. And this is our mentor and coach and friend that you all know very well. I love it. All right, so you, you made it there. You have transformed your life, inspired by your parents and your environment. Most of you would give up. Hmm. And some, and I was just having this conversation with a Bible study group, and we were talking about close friends who committed suicide. Not more than 48 hours later, a request from another church member who wasn't even present sent a message saying, would you pray for my family because my nephew just committed suicide? Mm, my Lord. It hit me because mm. I have people directly attached to me that have gone down this path. Mm. And I'm touched because you had that thought, those thoughts go mm. through your mind and you were strong enough to overcome mm. and now to put it in a book so that others who are going down that path can access and say i don't have to go there so yeah thank you for sharing that amen amen and i'll tell you it was just it was life-changing one to hear the audible voice of god when i was depressed oppressed laid in bed didn't eat for almost 24 hours or so um but it, things began to shift when you talk, when you hear from God and grew up in church my whole life, you know, but it wasn't until I had several encounters. This was one of them, but several encounters where my life truly began to transform because I was open and I was willing to change. See, sometimes we're not willing to change, but if we don't change, we'll stay the same and everything else around us will progress. And I think the challenge is, we don't want to get up sometimes. We want to lay down because we're not willing to do the work that it takes to get better, to be better, and to impact the world, you know, with the gospel, with uh, inspirational messages, with the right stuff. And you know what? The right stuff is, for me, just keep getting up. Just keep getting better. Just keep being transformed. Just keep looking up and saying, God, thank you for another day. If you give me another day, I'm going to give you 150%. I told you I was the, a linebacker at two, but I was a linebacker on the field, captain of the defense, and I wouldn't let anybody give up. And I definitely wasn't going to give up. And that was the tenacity 
that was instilled in me in me at a very young age, going through a very difficult time of being placed in foster care. So now we're going to move from where you are, fast forward to today. You are a public speaker, now an accomplished published author. Mm -hmm. Tell us about today and how you are helping the business owners mm -hmm. out there in their corporate environment to take that transformation and inspire transformation in their organizations. Yes, thank you, Samuel. And for those companies or corporations, for those organizations, for those schools, uh, for the marketplace, you know, as an author, as a speaker, as one who has overcome, as one who is rising above, my mission and goal is to impact the world with this transformational leadership and transformative learning, wisdom and process to help your company, your employees, not only be transformed, but the, the culture to be transformed into the vision of the organization, the mission of the organization, what it is that you want to accomplish. My, my goal in life is to impact change, to impact transformation, to go from no to go, if you will, to go from nobody to somebody, to do the things getting up, you know, uh, putting, you know, lacing up those bootstraps. Like my grandfather said, my birth grandfather, late grandfather was a Korean War veteran. And man, I'll tell you, I learned so many things from him. And one of those things I've learned is about the discipline. One of the things I would share with your organization or your company is, you know, studying your mission, your core values, your culture, and then coming to you uh, with something well thought, well planned, and something that will change your entire culture for the better will change each and every individual in your organization for the better. Will increase sales, increase productivity, and just increase overall wellness, especially mental wellness. It's critical. What I've learned is that if you are not mentally well, you can't be well for anybody. That's true. So mind, body, spirit are critical. And if one of those is out of line, anything and everything can fall apart, even your organization. So for somebody who wants to do business with you, do you have like prerequisites that they must meet? Who is your ideal customer avatar? Who's your ideal persona that is looking for you to do business with? My ideal avatar um, would be somebody who is looking for change. Somebody's looking to say, how can I go from a little bitty foster kid <laughs> to a coach, speaker, author, and scholar in transformational leadership? Yours might not be exactly what I've just said, but each one of you have a goal. Each one of you have a place that you want to be and that you want to go. And my avatar is for those who may have been broken, those who may have committed, uh, had thoughts of committing suicide, those who may have felt abandoned by their family and by their friends and by whoever else. Those are the ones that I'm called to speak to, the ones who want to make a difference in the life of others, the ones who want to make a greater impact in whatever area that is, whatever that is for you. But if you want change, if you want to go and go to a place where you can be a transformational leader and help others transform into the people that they desire to be, then I'm your guy. So tell me, tell, I'm gonna ask you to tell you on the next side, I'm gonna, what can somebody, what can the audience do right now to start a transformational change in their life that they can see results tonight? What you can do tonight, right now, to see a transformational result. And this is the first thing, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll give you resort back to Jack Mesereau, a transformational scholar and leader that I stood upon his shoulders. And there was one thing, two things, and I'll go for it. It said in one and two, there were a few other things, but uh, disorienting dilemma, 
Let me know what that is for you. And you think about what that is for you. But the one thing you can do is the self-examination. That's number two. Dig deep. Go to your journal. I don't care if you've never journaled before. Self-examination, pluses, minuses, where I want to go, what I did, where I failed, where I, where I didn't fail, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. Journal that down. And then the self-examination is really look at the man in the mirror mm. and say, am I who I'm supposed to be? Am I who God created me to be? Am I making the impact and the difference in the lives of the people uh, that God sent me here to be a blessing to? So get out your pens, your pencils, and your paper, and begin to look at disorienting dilemmas in your life, self-examination, and truly dig deep and look at the man or woman in the mirror. Cool. That was wonderful. I took some mental notes, and I'm going to go home and look in the mirror and do a deep, introspective, analytical look and say, okay, Am I the version that I want to be? Mm, and yes. what I don't like, I will start to attack. So you attack your lack. Attack, attack your lack. I like that, Samuel. I love it. And for anyone out there who would love to get in touch with, with me, um, Dr. Howard, you can reach me um, at Dr. That's D-R-M-A-N-U-E-L-H-O-W-A-R-D dot com. My website and you can always reach me at 484-687-3036. And we're going to carry on with my brother here, Samuel Robinson, who I adore. And this is a mutual friend connected us. And I just thank God for the connecting of brothers. This is Samuel F. Robinson on Embracing AI, the Lifestyle. And you've just had a sneak peek into the lifestyle of Manuel Stay tuned for future episodes. Let me hear your comments below. And yes, the website will be on the screen.